to start the show, I just wanted to pull up a couple stats here mm -hmm. and tell people who they're listening to right now. Cool. Um, I'll give you an opportunity to obviously introduce yourself. But yeah, just a, just a couple things off the list right now. Founder of Hearst Boys, professional tattoo artist, media consultant for companies like Showtime and Amazon, worked on Jesus and Mero, content creator, actor, musician. I'm sure there's 50 other things that you can do that you haven't even told anybody about yet. When I put it all in list form, I was like, holy fucking shit, like, this is crazy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah, go ahead. If you want to introduce yourself, tell the people what you're yeah what you're up to these yeah days. yeah um well before i do that jake i just want to say i'm super proud of you man like Thank you. you're you're making shit happen bro and like on top of everything like on top of all the stuff you're doing with like uh 3m or m3 m3 yeah, yeah, yeah. with like with uh with m3 the printing stuff like this podcast and you know you still you know you still like you still show up at the shop you're like you know what i'm saying you're you're like you're like on the bench at the shop still like yeah. You know, and uh and and you getting strong all in the <laughs> all in the meantime. You're getting big on me, bro. No, What's going on? No. What's happening, just man? Just trying to stay healthy. That's yeah, it. dude. Yeah. No, but I but yeah, I just want to say I'm proud of you, man. This is Appreciate really dope. It. Um But yeah, no, uh yeah, my name's Rainy, uh Rainy Ovalle on all my socials. Uh I mean, I, I there's really nothing I can say that you haven't said already, but uh yeah, I guess I do all those things, but I do them in bursts like right. Uh, you know, I was a tattooer for a decade. Um, before that, I was 17 and in, in college, and I dropped out of Fordham, became a tattoo artist, did that and music for a little while. Then I became a father, uh, pretty much stopped the music and, like, shifted more towards tattooing. Tattooing was always a constant, but I shifted more towards, like, uh, content creation and, and uh, you know, uh, and starting Hearst Boys, which is... Uh, which is uh we're predominantly like just like a video game focused like multimedia kind of group like we also create content we stream we play video games we have a discord community and um yeah so i think you know uh just to put it in perspective for your listeners and 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 viewers it's not all at once like yeah. you know it's impossible to really to really balance all that stuff especially right. after having a kid and stuff but uh yeah i guess that's me you know rainy rapper producer tattoo artist content creator, writer, digital consultant, social media manager, and brand strategist. So definitely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we'll get into it a little bit later about more so how you've kind of split up that time and like how yeah. you've progressed through it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I kind of want to take it back just to start uh, to where it all started. I know um, you're from the Bronx and that's like heavily influenced you. So if you could maybe speak to that a little bit growing up, like what was that like for you? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, the Bronx is not kind like it's it's not it's the Bronx like made me who I am and that's why I champion the Bronx so much because like yeah growing up like wasn't you know it, it wasn't it, it wasn't a fucking walk in the park you know what I'm saying like we were broke as hell like you know mom's mom Dukes was pretty much alone the first six years of my life then she met my stepdad then they you know they moved in together they had a kid and all that like they had my little sister and you know like it like but the entire time, you know, it's been it's been an uphill battle pretty much because like, you know, we're we weren't exactly in a environment condu conducive to like, you know, mental health and and eating healthy and all that stuff. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like there's food deserts, there's all this stuff. I mean, the Bronx is for I don't know if it is anymore, but I'm pretty sure it was the poorest county in the in the country for like a long time. And yeah. Um, you know, in the early nineties when I was born and growing up in the late nineties, early two thousands, like it was, it was, uh, it was a fucking zoo out here, yeah. you know? Um, but I always say this, like, I would not change a single thing. Like none of the struggle, you know what I'm saying? None of the, none of the hardships that nothing like my mom, you know, my mom messed up along the way here and there, but at like, you know, as I, as I grew up, I, w I just realized that like, that was just her trying her best. You yeah. know what I mean? That was just her doing her best under the circumstances with the cards she was dealt and yeah, the Bronx that and being where I'm from, there's nothing like it. There's no energy like the Bronx. Like look at Cardi B, look at ice spice on the rise right now. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Look at Calvin Klein, look at fucking, uh, um, uh, Ralph Lauren, like Bronx legends. You know what I'm saying? Like yep. Stanley Kubrick went to Clinton. Like it's insane. Like, you know what I'm saying? Big pun, like the birthplace of hip hop. Like it's, the Bronx is so special and there's yeah. really no place in the world like it. Yeah. I never really understood that. Um, I mean, obviously I didn't 
grow up. I didn't even grow up like in Westchester, so I wasn't even near the Bronx. I was, yeah. I was upstate. Yeah. Like upstate, upstate. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, growing up, I it was kind of funny because I, I remember like my cousins or like Chris and, and other people would be like, you live in a bubble. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Like, this is just, this is, this is how everybody lives no? Yeah. And then like moving down here and then seeing other, like other communities and other people and everything. It's like, I was like, oh, that is there. That was kind of a bubble. So it, <laughs> yeah. you know, it is interesting to kind of have a little bit more perspective. And I think it's important for people to understand, like whoever's listening, um, to kind of get that a little bit, a little piece of that perspective for like where you're coming from. Um, cause I think it's heavily influenced, obviously you as a person, as you mentioned, and also the things that you do, uh, one of which being Hearst Boys, which I know you kind of, you package it as a, like a gaming organization, but it's mm-hmm. also a community based like thing, thing yeah. that, yeah. Pe- you know, for the community, like yeah. kind of giving back. So how did, how did you go about starting Hearst Boys? Um, what was that process like? And, and, you know, what were some of your goals when you started that? Yeah. Uh, I think, so the main goal for Hearst Boys was to make black kids like, visible like the to to increase visibility on like black and brown folks increase visibility for the bronx in the gaming space because yo some of the funniest motherfuckers and some of the some of the funniest like some of the funniest people and some of the most competitive and like just like hard working like gamers specifically fighting gamers that i've ever met like some of the best players some of the best fighting game players i've ever met have been from the bronx and they've been super funny and for some reason, 90% of us are Dominican and like, you know, and like there's a, com- there's community there already. And I think like in the professional space, at least, um, you know, when we talk like professional, meaning like we go to tournaments, we, you know what I mean? It, it's not just about printing a Jersey. You know what I mean? It's like, we, we show up, we deep, you were squatted up and you know what I mean? We, we come to do damage and like that, when it comes to that, like as far as visibility in, in that space, any sort of like professional organization seemed to be really homogenous. Like it seemed like in, in the FPS, you know, first person shooter, like category, a lot of those competitors, uh, a lot of the time were, 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 uh, sorry, like, um, like rainbow six siege and stuff like okay. that. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like in those spaces, like it was typically, you know, like a either white CSGO or, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Most of those competitors in the in that professional space, top level play, it's either white kids or you know Scandinavian or whatever, and like a lot of like the team based stuff, like the League of Legends and all that shit. Like again, mostly Scandinavian, Scandinavian. A lot of fighting game representation. It's mostly Asian, mostly white. You know what I mean? So like, so like, I felt like uh, the Bronx didn't have like, for lack of a better term, like a mascot. Okay. You know what I mean? And like. I wanted Hearst Boys to be where people could point to in the Bronx and be like, oh, the Bronx, these guys are doing this out of the Bronx. Like, and um, yeah, I mean, the way that started, that that's pretty much how that started. And, um, you know, we had a little business going. We had a little space for us. And I remember, I think I remember uh, showing you and, and Chris. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That space we ran out of the Bronx, it was, it was perfect. But the pandemic kind of screwed us, you know, mm-hmm. social distancing, masking, all that. Like, you can't really, you can't, you know, fighting games, especially in a competitive sense, like the cult, a lot, like more than half of what makes up the culture is sitting next to your opponent. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And like that energy, that, that electricity, like, yeah, it's, it, it doesn't work, you Talking know, unless it's and, in person. Yeah. Game, yeah. So, you know, that ended up negatively affecting our business and like, we ended up losing that space and haven't really been back, but nobody's forgotten about Hearst boys and no. I doubt they ever will. Yeah. Well, I think it's also like important to recognize that you know, sometimes there's like a business will take many shapes over time. Yeah. Um, you know, whether it's an in-person thing where people can go to or it's like a an online community where, you know, you're doing other things. Like I remember uh, or I still see you sometimes from time to time streaming and doing other things like that online. Um, but I think it's important for people to also hear the, the fact that, um, you know, obviously your business will change and it'll evolve over time. And there are circumstances where sometimes like you know, things are insurmountable. If you have like a pandemic and you can't do in-person games, then that's just something that will like ruin your business. And that's okay. Like, yeah, yeah. it's not, it's not a negative. It's not a knock on you. It's like, this is a part of being a a business owner or an organization owner. Um, I think it's important for people to hear that because oftentimes everybody wants to tell like the super success story Yeah, and it's not always like that. Yeah. And I think, I think it's important for people to, um, uh, understand that like they, 
like when you see an Apple or an Amazon, like what you're seeing now is the result of, of the work that you didn't see. Right. The same. So like, I guess for anyone listening that, that like wants to be a business owner or something like, yeah, you can have that success story, but two things you have to be are patient and malleable. Mm -hmm. Like you have to be able to bend and, and, and shape yourself and really, uh, I guess adjust to the circumstances that, that befall your business because, you know, Hearst boys, I could have said, you know, screw this. I'm out of here. Like enough, like Hearst boys is over. We're done because I sank like, I mean, this probably isn't a huge investment to somebody with money, but somebody like me that came from nothing, like I invested like maybe $13,000 into that space. Like no, that's, that's a lot of bread yeah. for, for somebody like, you know what I mean? For me, from where, from, I think for most people, that's a lot of money where like, I come from. Yeah. yeah. That, for most people, that's not, that's not an insignificant amount of money. That's yeah. like, you know, that's a used car. That's, you yeah. know, a college loan for somebody like yeah. that's, that is something that's, you know, I think sometimes with social media and stuff the proportion of money gets blown out of like yeah. it gets blown out of proportion and people lose perspective on it because like you see the guy who's dropping like five hundred thousand dollars on like a oh i, I just did five hundred thousand dollar deal but it's like that's not that's it's not, it's real, not real it's yeah. not real yeah it's yeah not it's real not real and a lot of it like what 13, you see is a lot of money <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah what you see on social media is, is a fabrication of of uh or or i would say um an alteration of like what the real circumstances are. So like I very much could have been like after the pandemic, after we lost the retail space, like I very much the retail tournament space, I very much could have been like, all right, well, this is it. Like it's over. I'm done. Like, I don't want to do this anymore because I was really discouraged, but I was like, nah, you know what? Like, this is just us another, like, I feel like it would have been worse if I took that L and never did anything again, as opposed to, you know, adjusting, adapting. And then that way, later on down the line, we founded Hearst Boys in 2017. By 2027, I can be like, yo, remember when the pandemic fucked us? Yeah. And like, we didn't give up and like, look, look at where we are, you yeah. know? Well, I think like the ethos of this podcast so far has kind of been like taking obstacles and making them opportunities. And that's really yeah. like what it's about. And that's what you're saying. Like, you know, when you it's it's just it's a it's just a fact like it's you're gonna run into obstacles and it's what you do with that that really matters um you know taking that opportunity to change the direction of the business and then maybe you know like you said you come back around and then maybe you open up another space when that time comes exactly yeah yeah so, um i think yeah. uh hearst boys has been shifting from like streaming and stuff uh because uh street fighter 6 is about to come out and that's a game that we've all been excited for. Uh, so we're going to get back into competing and stuff. But I think for me, like, as I look at you, like as a, you know, as an inspiration, like for, for my, for the merch side of Hearst Boys, yeah. like I see how you run M3 and I'm like, damn, like, you know, like, like maybe we could ramp up the, you know, the merch with Hearst Boys and like really get something going with that. So like, I do want to also break into like the fashion space as well. And one thing that, that, that makes me, more uh i guess one thing that makes me more likely to support a business is if i see profits going back into it right so like for me um like this brand i'm wearing like uh like ml leon door right like they they were established in 2014 teddy santis you know this uh greek dude a lot of his clothes a lot of his styles very heavily greek influenced like he's got a cafe and stuff and um it had been like there was like a good time like it had been like a year since i'd been back like i just went back recently the other day to get some more stuff and it looked completely different like at first it looked like you know your it looked like a greek like grandma's house you know like the retail store it was like a couch a coffee table and then all the re- like the retail like all the clothing around it so yeah. it was like it felt really homey okay i went there now they got a porsche on the like in the floor of the of the of the of the of the store yeah they have a porsche like si- literally sitting there like a 50s 60s porsche with emelion door in in metal fucking shit yeah pressed yeah. onto it like and so like it looks like a cigar lounge you know what i mean it looks like a speakeasy or something right and the cafe looks so different too they've got emelion door in tile on the floor and it's amazing and like you know i'll go there and people will be like you know well why well, why, you know, why are you paying this much for, for a shirt? Why are you paying this much for some pants? And it's like, you know, is it a lot? Yeah, I agree. A hundred percent. It's a lot from, mm-hmm. as somebody that came from 
nothing. Yeah. 80, 80, $90 for a t-shirt is crazy. Yeah. But I, it, it makes me feel good knowing that when I go back, I'm like, Oh, this is what my $90 is going towards. Like this, like the aesthetic of the business and like more designs, more drops. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. it's not, it's not, uh, for me, it's, I feel personally when I see stuff like that, I feel like an investor. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, I, I think I think a part of that too is a, a trend that I think hasn't really shown itself either yet. But I think this will be something that happens in the future, in the sense that with you know all of these companies, like these large corporations, like the Amazons, and you know you're, you're talking about um, like Fashion Nova mm -hmm. or or like um, Shein, Shein, yeah, yeah, Shein, like all of those companies, right? They're just gonna slash down the cost to the bone. Like mm -hmm. they're gonna be using child labor in other countries. They're yeah. gonna be like not ethically sourcing any of their stuff. And I think at a certain point, we're going to see like more of that mindset that you have where people like, obviously, you know, people who are in a position to now, you know, uh, maybe make that choice are yeah, going yeah, yeah. to make that choice. Yeah. They're going to, they're going to have to separate. Um, well, do I want the cheapest option or do I want the option where the company, you know, cares for its employees, it cares yeah. for the workspace. Like it's not just trying to quickly turn out stuff. It's like actually, caring about the product that they give to us. And that also has been something, you know, for me with like M3 merch and stuff, that's what I've always been trying to do with the business. Like even, yeah. and to your point of like putting money back into the business, like I literally haven't like made oh, anything. Oh, haven't paid it. yourself? No. Oh yeah, no, yeah. no. Chris, Chris, Chris was my favorite episode because yeah. that he the whole time he's just like, oh yeah, you know, I mean, it's brutal. I mean, every single <laughs> penny goes back in and then you wonder like, when am I going to see anything out of this? Like, I love that. <laughs> I love that you started a business podcast and Chris walked in and immediately was like, do not start a business. Yeah. But that's, but that's real. That's real. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that's yeah. the thing. I That's why I started yeah, this podcast. And, and no I one else is going to say that. Yeah. You know, Chris, like. No one's gonna. No one's gonna yeah. come in here and bear their soul like Chris. Yeah. You know, like because yeah. and, and and that's why people fuck with him. Shout out Chris. Shout out. Shout out Chris Wilcock. Yeah. Love you, bro. Still. <laughs> but um. No. But yeah, for real. That's a. That's the mindset I'm trying to have with Hearst Boys too. Where it's like, okay, we're starting on the ground floor, but by the time it gets to a specific, a certain level of quality, mm -hmm. I want people to feel about Hearst Boys the way I feel about Emile Leon Dor. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I mean, I think you're. Obviously, you're being being like malleable, like you mentioned, being flexible and, and just adjusting to your conditions. I think you're already like in a better position than most people because a lot of people out there are either just like it either works or it doesn't. And if it breaks me, then I'm just going to quit and that's it. Yeah. But if you have that endurance, like it's definitely going to give you that edge over other people. Yeah. And this is where being from the Bronx comes into play, you know, yeah. like that steadfast mindset that like give it 110 every time, even mm -hmm. when it doesn't work, like because yeah. The Bronx has been the Bronx. Any time the Bronx has gotten shine, it's been in spite of being counted out. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Like that has a lot to do with me as a person, and I think that has a lot to do with like the like. It's no coincidence that Calvin Klein is Calvin Klein. It's no coincidence that Ralph Lauren is Ralph Lauren, and they're from the Bronx. That is not a coincidence. Right. Like you know what I'm saying. Like you only get that level of you. you like you. You only get that. Uh, that like endurance endurance yeah. being from a place like that you know what i mean mm -hmm. like like kanye is from the south side of chicago you think kanye would be kanye if he was from like fucking akron ohio like right, right. <laughs> do you know what i mean like well, it'd be lebron like well LeBron, yeah yeah LeBron exactly from, but that's oh okay lebron was from akron uh, there we go i don't think that's a good place i don't think that's like the best place to yeah. grow up either oh, hold on no uh damn what am i thinking um, of oh yeah fucking riverdale you know okay what I mean? yeah, like, yeah riverdale like riverdale. you think yeah, you yeah, think yeah, yeah. yeah you think he would be that yeah. who he is be, or I would be who I was yeah. if I grew up in fucking two million two million dollar home average Riverdale. Right. right. Nah. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I mean, those are like it it is what it is, you know. I yeah. think I think that's kind of like the great equalizer. The one thing that people can kind of I mean, you don't want to go through that situation if yeah. you don't have to, but also I think like the added benefit of that is being more resilient than other people. You're you are more resilient than somebody who like grew up with a trust fund and like never had to worry about anything in their life because ultimately as soon as something gets hard, like they're going to crack under the pressure. Yeah. And whereas like if you were in that situation, I think you'd, you'd be more inclined to succeed versus the other person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. For sure. So I think that is like, if there's one like hopeful outlook to it, it's like, that's kind of like the great equalizer, you know? 
yeah. in, in a sense. Yeah, um, for sure. We kind of talked about it a little bit. Um, I think, you know, I would, I'd, I would hate it if we didn't like talk about this a little bit. Uh, this, you know, just like your social media presence yeah, because yeah. you, you've been like so good at, at growing your audience. And I think that would be, be very beneficial for people to kind of like hear a little bit about oh, of course. how you've done that. Of course. Um, uh, so the media landscape now changes way more often than it did 10 oh, years also, ago. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I, don't, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, don't worry. But just, just for people who don't know, 27,000 followers on Twitter, 23,000 on TikTok, 5,000 plus followers on Instagram. Um, obviously, that number is always growing. I don't even know what it's going to be at when this comes out. But <laughs> yeah. but um, yeah, so just, just to kind of qualify this a little bit. And, yeah. Yeah, go um, ahead. I think uh, the first and foremost is showing up as your authentic self mm. um, because the media land, the, the social media landscape at least is ever changing and every year it changes faster. Um, fortunately, like 10 years ago or nearly 10 years ago, I got in on the ground floor on Vine of mm. all places and like Vine was really only around for like a year or two, but I definitely like developed like a cult following on there. Just like, and like, I wasn't really doing like skits or anything like King Bach or whatever, but like, I, I was just, you know, being my authentic self and people thought it was funny. And then shortly thereafter, I made a Twitter and that's when I started more doing more of like the scripted content and like, you know, the other stuff, uh, like, but the, 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 the main draw the main focus for me has always been like okay i'm not gonna change anything about me i'm just gonna do this thing the way i would do it like i'm gonna make content i think is funny right and then if people if people fuck with it then then you know then cool yeah. but like because the thing is right like you only remember you only remember you only remember the the, the great ones right like like you you only remember Terminator Two. You don't remember like Terminator Genesis. Do you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, there's a there's been a lot of duds. Like there's been a lot of like trial and error. A lot of like just posts that go nowhere and get yeah. no traction. And then there have been random posts that like I didn't think would do well that ended up doing amazing and 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 doing a ton of numbers. So I think for anyone watching this that like wants to sort of break into the social media landscape, I guess like my biggest word of advice is like, stop thinking about it and just do it. Because by the time you're done thinking about it, it will have changed again. And you'll have to adjust your voice again. And you'll have to adjust your approach again and again and again to keep like, you know, to keep conforming to a landscape that's constantly changing. So right. um, I think for me personally, the way, the, so yeah, that's the way I grew. My audience was really just staying true to myself and being my authentic self and like showing bearing like bearing just as much as I want people to see and when I want people to know right. you know because they're ex like I'm pretty explicit on online but I'm only as explicit as I want to be yeah you know yeah. yeah you're not like you you have your own personal boundaries that you want to set right yeah but I think that is interesting though like being original um in the sense that I think we've seen, especially with, you know, apps like TikTok, where it runs yeah. like directly off of trends. Yeah. You kind of see a ton, like you see a thousand copycats for every one original. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of, you know, like you said, that's your key there because, you know, yes, you can gain the following by being the copycat who just follows the trend. Yeah. But if you're the guy that sets the trend or if you're the guy that's coming out with original content, um, then that's that's going to set you apart from other people. That's going to get you like yeah. those followers that are actually interested in you, not just you copying a trend that's happened a thousand other times. Yeah. And you'll also only like for the trendy TikToker, you'll also only be as relevant as the last trend, mm. you know? And like, that's what I've done. That's what I've done the work to avoid really. Yeah. Like I'll only, I'll only participate. Like I will not do a fucking TikTok dance, man. Yeah. Get that shit out of my fucking face. I'm 20. I'm, I'm, I'm damn near 30 years old. <laughs> what the fuck do I look like doing these elaborate <laughs> ass dances? Yeah. What the fuck? You guys are doing fucking Super Bowl choreography in your Nana's basement. Yeah. I'm not doing that shit. I'm the cosplay stuff. Sign me up. Video game stuff. Sign me up. Anime. Hell yeah. Film, TV. Absolutely. Yeah. But them fucking dances, bro, I'm not doing it. I'm <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, it's it's the same thing. You're, you're following a trend and, mm -hmm. you know, like some of them are all right. But ultimately, I think 
what sets you apart is people people get a little glimpse of you too which is important mm-hmm. i've seen like you know obviously like you do have a like relatively substantial following on both on two like two platforms and instagram um but what really surprises me about your your platforms is just the amount of engagement like i see you post a video and like literally two minutes later you got like 10 10 comments and 100 likes in like a in a few minutes mm-hmm. and it just shows that your audience that is watching you and following you is really there to support you they're yeah. not just they're not ju- you're not just like some random person that they followed because oh you told a funny joke once it's yeah like, they know when rainy post they're like oh rainy post yeah rainy posted it's not just like some random guy yeah no thank you that that, that does mean a lot and yeah. i think the key to that is just making everybody feel seen yeah and also just like keeping shit positive you know like i feel like a lot a lot of the media landscape the social media landscape now is like pranks or criticism or just just generally just acting in bad faith hmm. and like that has never been me you know what i'm yeah. saying like that that has never been my energy, bro. Like I, I'm, I'm the main goal has always been to make people laugh. Yeah. And the reason I think that I get as much engagement as I do, excuse me, is because when I get that engagement, I make, I make people feel seen. Like I make, I make those people feel seen where like, if they tell me good job, this is amazing. I'll go, thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Yeah. You know, like I make pe- like I, I, I will never put myself on this pedestal. Like I'm some celebrity. I, I, I hate the idea of that. Like, yeah. I just want to, I just want to make money doing cool shit. Yeah. You know, I'm not here to act like I'm better than anyone or anything like that. Like I, I genuinely just, just want to eat off this stuff that I think is cool. Mm hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, and that, that's, that's important, you know, for people, whether you're, whether you're like marketing a business or you just are personally creating a social media platform to, you know, make content just, you know, by yeah. yourself. Like, I think it's important to recognize that. And that's kind of why I, you know, wanted to ask you a little bit about that because yeah. I think it is, it's important for people to hear. Yeah, for sure. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about, uh, obviously we alluded to it a little bit at the beginning. But uh, your time as a tattoo artist, mm-hmm. um, do you want to maybe talk about how you got into that and, and yeah. some of your story, like, you know, kind of that put you in that space? Yeah, for sure. We could do that. Um, so I got into Fordham University at 17 and that sounds like, oh, wow, cool. Like, you know what I mean? Like a lot of people that 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 don't that never went to college or whatever, like that sounds impressive. It's not. My birthday is just late. So my mom would have, would have rather put me in school early and so that I'd graduate at 17 as opposed to graduating at 19 Right. because my, my, my birthday is in December. So, you know, a lot of the schools were like, okay, well he has to be three years old to be in three K. And my mom would be like, well, he will turn three in like during the, the school, the school year. Right. So that's how that happened. Uh, just for some context, I'm not like, I'm not, I'm not smart whatsoever, <laughs> but, um, so yeah, so I graduated 17. I start at Fordham that same summer because they had this program called H E O P with, uh, <clears throat> um, I, I forget what the H stands for, but it was just, you know, uh, equal opportunity program. Right. Like it was one of those, you know, uh, and they were like, we'll pay for everything, but the, 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 the catch is you have to start like now, like this summer. So I essentially didn't have a summer break after high school. Like I, you know, that's when everybody wiles out and has fun and shit. But the thing is, I was still 17. All my friends were 18. You know, all, I've, all my friends have been older for the most part of my life. So like they were all 18, 19 doing adult shit. You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. and I was still 17. So I was like, okay, well, I'm not really going to do anything with my, with my friends. And I'm too broke to go anywhere to like travel. So fuck it. I'll just start school now. So I started, uh, at Fordham, hated it, dropped out pretty much a semester and a half later, like right when I turned 18 and for my 18th birthday, I got my first tattoo. And that wasn't the tattoo that made me, that made me want to, uh, want a tattoo. It was my like second or third. And which was this one, which was done by Mike, Mike Valentine, a friend of ours, Yep, yep. you know, and I told him, like, I saw this and it made me so happy, this mermaid. And I was like, yo, I think I want to do this because I was feeling super lost, like after, you know, dropping out of Fordham because I'm like, okay, the college, like, and I go to college, I get a job, I I get a career, I buy a house, you know what I mean? Like Like it was all coming up too fast. Yeah, 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 yeah. And like, and so, you know. 
when that didn't pan out, I was like, I was fucking terrified, you know? And like, uh, but then I got this tattoo and it felt like therapy, dude. And then like the end result too is what like, is what was really awesome for me because like, it made me so happy just looking at it. Like, wow, I have this art on me forever. And I was like, yo, Mike, I think I want a tattoo. And the first thing he said was, no, you don't. <laughs> Straight up, the first thing he said was like, no, you don't. You don't want to do this shit. Like, the, you do not want to be doing the this. The Chris of tattooing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, you want you want nothing to do with you this. Want, <laughs> yeah. I don't want any part of this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. So, so I dropped out. Uh, I get tattooed. And, you know, against his better judgment, I go and buy a bunch of stuff from Unimax. Mm-hmm. Shout out Unimax. I go get my tattoo license. Ugh, whatever. Like, that For, shit is yeah. such a joke. You need it in the city. You right? need it in yeah. the city. But yeah. that shit is such a joke. They don't give a fuck about that shit. They just they just want to charge you more money so they can give you a piece of paper that doesn't mean anything. Right. But I go to I go get my, my, my license, and then I go to Unimax. My mom buys me a bunch of stuff. And then I, I start tattooing porous fruits. Right. Like bananas and, and oranges and shit in my room. Have have you like before before you um st- like got the tattoo with with Mike and um started the tattooing and everything? Had you been like drawing or yeah. into art before that? Or, oh you know? yeah, 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 yeah. I've been drawing my whole life. Okay, yeah. So okay. like I've been drawing since I was like four. Okay. Um, because like you know we didn't have cable or nothing, so like paper and and crayons and shit like that those are the cheapest like yeah. toys or whatever and you know a blank sheet of paper like my imagination went crazy i could do it i could make anything you know yeah. so that's why i fell in love with art and shit uh like super young like four or five years old but yeah so i uh so i drop out um buy a bunch of stuff i'm tattooing fruits in my room like literally six months of me just sitting on my windowsill just going at it going at it um and i would and i would determine uh like i would determine the depth based on how the fruit would bruise. Mm. So like if I was tattooing a banana, like obviously if I drew, if I drew blood essentially from the banana, which was like the, I'm like, okay, this is way too hard. If it bruised a bunch and like, you know, the ink spread, I'm like, nah, that's still too hard. If it didn't show up enough, I'm like still too light. So I was doing that, perfecting that, you know, then, uh, I start at this tattoo shop that will not be named because I'm not trying to give them clout, but it was basically the most chaotic first four years of any tattooer. Like, it, like I was like, it was like gladiator school, like the fucking trenches, um, Man. for like four years. Was that an internship or did they just like, or uh, not an internship, uh, uh, an, apprenticeship? an apprenticeship? No, yeah. no, they, no? they just threw me in the fire because like, fuck it. Yeah. Cause okay. the, cause the, the shot. Well, I also like, I had tattooed a few people at home and they saw that I was competent and they were like oh no nah, like we we got to get this guy now okay. cuz he's going to cuz like if he keeps going at this rate he's going to be a monster and we need him here right. so like so yeah so it was fucking it was fucking brutal those 4 years were fucking crazy but i left uh, cuz i'd had enough i was like this is dumb I'm not, i don't want to do this anymore um, so i left i went to several different shops uh, for the next year or two then i became a dad and like like a couple months after having my first kid, Godric, um, uh, you guys had addicted to ink. Uh, Chris offered me a job because Mike Valentine was leaving for the first time. Right. And he was like, I needed, you know, I need somebody to replace me. And I think you've been doing really well. I think you can do it. And I'm like, holy shit, this is amazing. I just had a kid. I'm going to make way more money. Like, mm-hmm. hell yeah, let's do it. And then I spent three or three or four years with y'all, I think. Three probably three i don't remember you were there before i showed up um well not i mean i was i was there a little bit before but like before i started working yeah yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you were already there for a few years um oh, so four then probably yeah, at least because yeah yeah at least four i would say maybe five wow yeah yeah that checks out oh yeah yeah wow like five years yeah because yeah. godrick's five and yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah so maybe just under five years but yeah so um and then like after during my tenure at addicted to ink um I get a call from D- from Mero of Jesus and Mero on Showtime, uh, and he saw what I was doing, you know, with the tattooing and like the content creation, and he was really impressed by my Thirty One Nights, Thirty One Frights series, which is a series on YouTube uh, that I only ever did once because it was just me right. watching the films, writing the script for the review shooting and editing these reviews i did 31 films which is a video every day and then i had to cut a two and a half minute version for twitter so that was 
30 that was 62 videos in a month that's insane yeah <laughs> that's insane. for yeah. for like people who don't understand what that is like i mean i do this podcast once a week and i will still spend like five or six hours just like editing it coming up with stuff for instagram and i'm like doing the bare minimum yeah so to do that every single day for a month for yeah. a month <laughs> two yeah, videos that's... two videos a day from for a month of 31 days yeah that's crazy sometimes more because like i tried to stay ahead of it you yeah. know what i mean like i tried to stay ahead of 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 the curve so to speak. So yeah. like by like September 29th, I was already working on like, excuse me, by like September 29th, I was already working on the first couple videos, you know? Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so, uh, Meadow was really impressed with that, like that sort of work ethic on top of having a, 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 a damn near newborn kid, you know, because, yeah, yeah. He, uh, he had been born that January and it was September, you know what I mean? So like still super young, my, he was still my little chunky baby. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so he was impressed with that. Uh, and he, he was like, yo, I want you to work on the show. And, oh, in those reviews in that series, I reviewed a film he was in and I reviewed it pretty positively, but I still had my criticisms But he was like, yo, I appreciate you, you know, being honest in your review, but not being a dick about it. Right. And like, he was like, I think we need that sort of energy in social. So I want you to run, I want you to run socials at Disa Samero with, with the rest of the digital team. So, so I get there and, uh, I'm pitching TikTok all of season three. Right. All of season three, I'm pitching TikTok, all while tattooing. So this is still going yeah, you're on. Still at the shop. I, was, I remember this. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I was still at the shop. I'm still tattooing, and then season four rolls around, and they offer to double my my pay, and that's when that's when my tenure at Addicted ends. Right. Yeah. So like, um, I mean, I was I was gonna, we'll come back to some of the other like tattooing related questions, but since you brought it up, uh, obviously being with these Samaro and and leaving Addicted to Ink, um. You know, obviously this is a business podcast and tip the typical like business podcast would not really talk about somebody leaving like their independent contracting job right, or right. They're, they're leaving their business <laughs> yeah. for a like standard job. Yeah. But I think, again, it's something important. It's something that actually happens. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so like, could you speak a little bit to what were some of the factors that kind of made you want to temporarily stop being like an entrepreneur or, mm -hmm. or a business owner in that like tattooing sense and then move more so into like a corporate job or yeah, you know, yeah. structure. I think the main reason was like, I just had to feed my family, man. You okay. know, like when I was, when I was alone and like single, like, yeah, I probably would have been, I probably would have been okay with still tattooing, you know, because the problem is like, once you have a kid, like your mind like shifts, dude, like, like that, that like primal, paternal lizard brain just mm -hmm. kicks in and it's like okay i need to do what's best for my family you know especially as a man like traditionally you know as the provider or whatever you got to go out and get it you know right and that that switch went off in my brain when i had godric and then shortly at, thereafter had griffin you know like my two sons i'm like okay i got these two baby boys like Something's got to give because like the thing about tattooing addicted to ink has no shortage of clients, no shortage of walk-ins. It's really an amazing place to work. Right. The problem is stability. Right. And, and that's not, that's not a dig at addicted. No, it's, yeah, it's yeah. the, it's the nature of the tattooing landscape yeah, as a industry. whole. That's, that's the, like, the industry. That's the whole industry. Yeah. 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 And any entrepreneurship really yeah. is, it's not going to be stable. Yeah, if I if I was like in your position, I think I agree. Like, if I had a kid right now, I wouldn't be able to not draw a paycheck and just like right. try to try to run a business. Like, it's not, right. You know, you have to worry about other people more than just yourself. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and like, and you know, for so that's that's the main reason why I left. And uh, the money they were offering me was was enough from both jobs. Yeah. You know, like I was making roughly. Like what I was making at both jobs, they consolidated and they were like, okay, well, we'll just pay you that much so you can dedicate your time to this. Because right. at, when season three wrapped, Merrill called me and was like, yo, uh, people are asking about you. They don't really see you in the office like that. And I was like, oh, because I'm still tattooing, bro. Yeah. And he's like, oh, word. Like, uh, how much? Like, I was like, yeah, I'm still tattooing because like the one check isn't enough. Right. And he's like, and he was like, how much are they paying you? And I told him and he hung up the phone immediately. Yeah. Hung up the phone, didn't say anything else. 
And then like a day or two later, he called me back and said, yo, we're doubling up your salary. That's crazy. Yeah. But I mean, that is, that is, I guess, also the nature of like a production situation like that where they have, you know, if yeah. you have Showtime money, you can spend Showtime <laughs> yeah, money. Yeah, 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 yeah. Versus like a, you know, a tattoo shop that is... Yeah, and know, it's all commission based. Yeah, you know, and that's so. a, that was another thing that made me. It was the stability and like, uh, the the like the the security. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because yeah. there is no security, and like it could be a dead week. Yeah, appointments could cancel. You know what I mean? And like, regardless of any of that, if you work in production, even if you guys have to reshoot, or it doesn't matter what you guys do that day. There's a union standard rate if you're union, and if you're not you're going to get paid whatever your contract says regardless. So, you know, whereas with tattooing and like with piercing and stuff, the money you make is, is related directly to the labor you put in. Right. Right. And like, I was just getting between raising two boys and like spending 10, 12 hours a day hunched over tattooing somebody. Like I was just, I I was getting exhausted, you know, like I was just exhausted with that, but I do still want to tattoo. Like I do yeah. still want to do it. I just want to do it my way because I feel like I'm, I'm kind of sick of like just street shop culture culture. Well, yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're primarily doing that for like to live off of, you kind of have to do the standard like industry practice of just like, I'll show up to the shop and whatever comes in, comes in and whoever books with me, I'll take whoever I can. Yeah. You know, I, I understand that probably as an artist, it would be more, um, you know, in uh, more favorable to be in the situation where you can kind of like pick and choose what tattoos you want to do. Right. Maybe even put yourself in a situation where you're like saying what tattoos you want to do. And, yeah. And that, that's interesting too. I mean, you know, I, I understand that. And I think again, it's just important for people to understand business owners, entrepreneurs, artists, whoever it is like when you're, when you're running a business, like, you have to accept some of those elements of like, you know, there won't be stability or, or there won't be a, a, a steady paycheck or, yeah. you know, things will happen. You don't always get to um, do things in a way that's conducive to the way that you plan them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 But, you know, I mean, ultimately, so, um, you know, talking about the stability though, I did, I did think this was like the one thing that I thought was like, not, not funny, but it was like kind of ironic in the sense. Yeah. Like, you went there for the stability and then what, what happened to the show? <laughs> because I remember like, I remember like, yeah. like uh, two months went by or something. And, mm-hmm. and then I, I noticed, I was like, I saw, I think I saw a tweet that you put out or something. Mm-hmm. I was like, Oh, what the fuck? Yeah. I went there for the stability and then the ship got real unstable. <laughs> um, Damn. Yeah. The foundation got real shaky. Yeah. Um, no. So uh, yeah. So Showtime pulled the plug. Yeah. They just canceled the show mid season. Super weird. And I guess that's, you know, that's the flip side of the coin too, of working with a big corporation. Like even, even with a show as big as Dee Samaro, it's like when you're talking about like suits that are just sitting in a, like a boardroom and they're just like, oh, well we're kind of done with this or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like now you're also, you know, the, the paycheck is steady, but it's only steady as long as, as the people at the top are like, yeah, we're going to keep them around Yeah, or, you know whatever the case may be there, it's like very yeah. syst- uh, sis- systemic. It's and, a systemic issue yeah. for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's why they hate unions, man. Yeah. That's why they hate unions. You got the writer's because, strike going on right now. Yeah, because like what's one guy with a billion dollars versus 10,000 people who all collectively have a yeah. billion dollars? You well, I saying? mean, I think that's just naturally part of like, you know, if you do want to talk about capitalism, I think that's a natural part of capitalism to yeah. have a union. If the, of course, in, in a free market, if the labor decides that they want to band together and leverage that, yeah, towards the other person, then that's also part of the free market. Like you can't, yeah, 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 yeah. you can't deny people that opportunity either. So. Yeah, you can't, you can't pick and choose. Like yeah. you can't pick and choose what's right and wrong based on whether or not those rights or wrongs benefit you yeah. at the time. Like, yeah, it's either, yeah, it's either all fair game or none of it is. Yeah, exactly. like it's either it either works or it doesn't, mm-hmm. and. I think as far as capitalism, really, I mean, that's a super deep conversation. At, like, but yeah, I think capital- save that for yeah another, another episode. Yeah, but ca- capitalism as a whole, I just think like fundamentally, I think it's 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 a uh, uh, it is inherently anti-community. It's inherently dog eat dog, and I don't and I 
I don't, it's not sustainable. Right. Well, um, I think it's pro, it's pro competition. Right. Um, but then obviously you get competitors changing from being competitive to just being assholes, <laughs> yeah. which is really where the problem lies. And, yeah. you know, obviously greed is yeah an inherent human trait for certain people and, and mm-hmm. you, you'll kind of run into that in any system. But, yeah. um, yeah, I mean, obviously that's. Like I said, we could we could probably do like a whole another hour on that. Oh, for sure. But um, just kind of shifting gears back to the tattooing, mm-hmm. um, because there was something I don't I don't know if you saw it. I put it out last week. That was the other podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, where I was talking about Tattoo Gate. Um, yeah. And obviously, since you're big on TikTok, I was wondering, like, did you see any of that stuff going on? Honestly, no, because no. my the new job I'm at now, um, I work at a I work at Amazon Prime Video Sports Talk, so I run I run their TikTok and Instagram and Twitter with my boy Dan Fox. Shout out to Dan. Um he's he's like my like we're like Jordan and Pippin but but we're both Jordan and Pippin. Like <laughs> like we you know like we we it's it it changes. Like yeah. you know what I mean? Um sometimes he'll pull a little more weight than me. Sometimes I'll do that and vice versa. And and that like that guy is my brother. Like I I yeah, I love that man and he's amazing. Uh great dude to work with, great friend outside of work. Like he's just all around super dope dude. Um, but, uh, yeah. So, <clears throat> sorry. So yeah, no, so you, I haven't, haven't, I haven't really had, seen any, any, any of tattoo gate because you, you haven't had yeah. enough time to be terminally online. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I haven't been, I haven't, you know, I don't have chronic, I don't have chronically online time yeah. anymore, yeah. you know? But yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess I, I'll give you a quick little summary of it just to kind of get your thoughts of it. Basically, um, this person uh, wanted to get a tattoo. She mm-hmm. she went on Instagram and like found an artist near her yeah. um, and went through the process that she had on her website. The lady charged her $180 for a consultation fee. And then only after the, um, she had the consultation was she told that there was a design fee. And there was three tiers to the design fee. So she could either pay her like 1500 for uh, a sketch and she would get no, or I think she got like one minor alteration. You could pay 3000 for uh, a sketch with two alterations um, or you pay 6000 and you get, uh, I think, three sketches and then you get to kind of actually have autonomy after spending $6,000 only and at that the- point. Six thousand dollars on top of the hundred and eighty. On top of the hundred and eighty, and on top of the tattooing too. That's that's just for the sketch. That's n- who 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 is this? Yeah yeah. Um, it's it's all over TikTok. Who, it, it, it's but, this artist. It's this artist in um, I believe Ontario, Canada, or Cambridge, Canada. Somewhere. Okay, so yeah. so she has this. She has this private studio. It's literally just her tattooing out of there. And basically, I guess she's just roping in unassuming clients who don't know how the tattoo industry works um yeah I'm, okay okay and the lady it was so upsetting too because the lady in the tiktok was actually super nice about it like she wasn't even like trying to go after the artist like as a as a um, like a bad like she, artist or yeah, anything yeah, yeah, yeah. She, like she wasn't making any personal attacks she was just straight up like i just really didn't like the way that i was talked to in these emails and the way that she went about charging me and stuff Nah, that's nuts. Yeah. And and the reason the reason I asked who is this is because yeah. I've been around for ten years. Yeah. I've been around P- Pooch, Stefano. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Like yeah. like Mike. Hello. Like yeah. You know, little Mike, motherfucker, yeah. Cash. Like yeah. we have heavy fucking hitters on our own roster at Addicted, and we know and we know world class like Sam. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like we yeah. know world class tattooers. Yeah. That. They and that have been in the game decades. I don't know a single person in real life moving like that. Yeah, not even Stefano, not even Paul Booth, not even like. And she had, and I mean, not that this really means everything, but she only had like three thousand followers on Instagram. She's not even like. No, that certainly means something because, like, if you like, the thing about follow count is like it doesn't matter until it does. Yeah, and and this is one of those instances where it absolutely matters because, like. Who are you? Yeah. To be charging this yeah. much bread. Yeah, you don't even have a following. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, and but my thing is like the you know, it it goes to that conversation of like tattooing is a luxury, mm-hmm. you know? Like a shirt, you can get a shirt anywhere. You can get a white tee from Target, but 
that same white tee from Ferragamo yeah. could be $400. And it's like, okay, well, what's the difference? And it's like, functionally, none. Yeah. But but aesthetically, maybe. Or the luxury, it's maybe. The brand, it's the brand. Or it's the quality. Exactly. Or it's the service that you received in the process of getting that item. Right, you know, right, like right. You know, like you go to... You go to like a Rolex store or something. You get like a personal, personal like salesman who's literally showing you stuff and yeah. like taking hours to like go through the catalog and like put yeah, you yeah. on lists and like you got their number, like all this stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it was crazy to see. And if anybody is listening and is still unsure of what we're talking about, uh, you can go back and listen to the last podcast, uh, episode seven, I believe. Um, but yeah, no, I was just like shocked watching that because you're. It was not only that, but it was like she did the she did this right, and then the sketch that she provided back to the lady was so shitty. Oh my it was, god! It was like you you literally could have drawn it like you could have drawn this in <laughs> in three minutes. I'm not even kidding me. Like you could have went on Procreate oh and just like made some pencil marks with the br- like with a pencil brush, <laughs> and it would have been done in three minutes. Damn! So at the yeah. very least, like it wasn't even. Like yeah. it wasn't even fire. Like no, oh for God. for fifteen hundred, like the six thousand dollar option, you get a canvas of your sketch. How nice of her! But like, <laughs> wow. For for fifteen hundred, you should get a fucking yeah. canvas yeah. of the sketch, and it should be full color, fully rendered, like as it is on the skin. Yeah. It should be not a sketch. It should be a literal like it final be a drawing. Finished, yeah, it should be a shading, finished piece coloring, of art. Yeah. Yeah. Like everything, and it and it wasn't. It was so bad, and she got torn apart for it. The the lady got like. I think like five and a half or six million views on TikTok alone. And then, um, God, yeah, they went, they went into, uh, you know, TikTok does what does what it does. And they found, they even found the guy that is running a course that's recommending these things and that they believe, uh, like was coaching this artist to charge these prices. So, Oh, Oh, I see. She, she like, she got bamboozled by this guy and is now bamboozling other people i would like to say it that way but i feel like that kind of lets her off the hook too like you're still a no, you're right yeah, you're still yeah, a thinking sure. person with a brain <laughs> yeah and you should also realize like that you're scamming people. yeah you're and scamming. also the guy the guy who's selling the course i don't think um was telling them what price is the charge he was just recommending like a three-tiered model where you give them like three pricing options yeah she's the one i guess that maybe set those prices oh um, i see but okay. regardless, like it, it was just a crazy story. And I was like, I was, you know, I was watching it and, and watching all the people on TikTok, like stitch the videos. Yeah. And stuff yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. But that, that lady got taken care of though. Um, Don't say it like that. What do you, no, 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 no. What do you no, mean? No, no. In, a, in a good way. In a good way. The 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 lady who posted the the original video, she got like, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. The community, oh. the community. No, no, no. Nobody died. Nobody I thought, died. No, I thought you meant like. Yeah, I they thought, sent a they sent an interior decorator to a house, Rainy. They got I thought, Yeah, I thought yeah, you no, was on some like. No. Hey, but you know the artist. Some sopranos. Somebody took care of yeah, her, yeah. you know? AI. <laughs> AI hey, I got an idea. <laughs> Go fuck yourself. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, no, but the the original content creator who made who the video the about getting scammed, okay. um, yeah. they like hooked her up. Like a ton of tattoo artists offered to give her free tattoos, and she got hooked up with a tattoo artist. Oh, that's awesome! Uh, she's getting flown out to like California to go get tattooed and everything. So, that's really cool. Yeah, it is kind of cool to see like the power of the internet in that sense and like community. Th- that's yeah. the thing, man. Like tattooers, like yeah, there's a million of us, but we all know each other. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So like, so the community is gonna show up when when it's necessary. Yeah, and I think artists in general are like more uh empathetic people yeah. like that's just the that's just like their personality that's, yeah. that's the personality that kind of goes along with yeah. being a creative person you have to be sociable yeah. like you have to you have to you have to know you have to mesh well with a bunch of different personalities yeah. and like know how to speak to people and meet meet people where they're at yeah so i think that's kind of what helped in the situation too just having like a community that is heavily empathetic and and looks out for people like this and yeah and and also that that the tattoo artist she wasn't physically harmed as far as i know um <laughs> but she was destroyed on instagram obviously like anybody or um i think they were like even they had her private shop on google reviews like they mm. they, they, oh, they review shit. bombed her but yeah but they got taken down because um sorry um because google google i guess um has like a no bot policy and like mm. when you get twenty thousand one one star reviews they're yeah. like oh like it's this wasn't assume, real yeah 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 Yeah. so you know i mean i kind of mentioned it too like i 
you know, I do kind of understand why they do that because also if you haven't received service from a business, I don't think you should review it. Yeah. Um, but I do also understand the flip side of that being like, well, if this person's a scammer, well, this person's like they should scamming, be known. Um, yeah, of yeah, course. They should be known. So it's kind of hard to balance that. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, she definitely, she definitely got called out, which is, which I think is good. I think people, you know, I'm not. I'm not one for like cancel culture or anything like that, but I think, you know, the internet no, is the internet. Yeah. And if you get called out for something, that's just part of it too. And yeah. you should have a right to, you know, she can, she's more than, no, she needs to be able held accountable. to, yeah, she's more than able to go make an Instagram post. And if she has receipts to tell a different story, then she can go tell that story. But it, it would be pretty hard to counteract yeah. what the original creator was saying because she came with like emails yeah, that's where nuts. the artist was like, being aggressive and rude and, yeah 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 no nah, no nah, it's clipped it's clipped for her yeah and um and that's yeah i mean that's what happens like you know when listen man i i i'm i'm probably among the last generation to really to really learn tattooing like in, n- not so much traditionally because i didn't have an apprenticeship or anything like that but like like i taught myself in the traditional sense like i didn't touch human skin for maybe like six or seven months and even that was still like pretty soon. Right. But that's just because I needed the fucking money, dude. Like I wasn't in school. I was 17. I was 18 broke as hell. You know what I mean? Like I needed bread. I needed to do something. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, you know, I was very modest with my prices. Cause I'm like, listen, I'm just figuring this shit out. Sometimes like for the most part, I was tattooing for free for a lot of the beginning of it. Like, so, you know, Oh, also another big, part of it was do everything learn learn lettering learn black and gray learn color learn traditional like yeah you know like like so for me it's like if you didn't come up like that yeah. and you in the, and and you exist your art exists in this sort of like pigeonhole where like you do this one specific thing and you think because you graduated from like pratt or sva or whatever that you can charge four hundred dollars a an hour out the gate. I'm sorry, you did not put that work in. Yeah, like you did not put that work in. You are not. You are not really from it like that. Yeah, you know. So, and yeah. that's and that's you know kind of what I was talking about last time too, where I was I brought up the point like I'm all for artists getting compensated fairly for their time and for their talent. And obviously, like if you're a high talent artist, if you're an insanely good artist, like you yeah. should be compensated fairly for that. But you can't skip the steps before that. Yeah, and just go from I have never tattooed at all to let me charge you $6,000 for a sketch. 6000 yeah. That's yeah. wow. Dude. And, but, but you know what that is? You know yeah. what that is? Um, from like a business aspect, I've kind of thought about it a little bit more. The reason that you have this tiering model, like even companies like McDonald's do this yeah. and they do it in the reverse way. But when you have three options, right? And you give and you give the six thousand dollar option. That's really just to get people to think that they're getting a deal with the fifteen hundred oh, dollar option. Yeah, yeah. It's like, but you're still paying fifteen hundred dollars, right. right? Just because you're not paying the six thousand, which is the the most expensive one, doesn't mean that the the bottom is still not expensive. Yeah. But a lot of you know, there's a lot of like marketing tips and and tactics that people use, and that's that's one of them that yeah. I think people should look out for. Yeah. Um, and they're just not honest. Like, I, again, I'm all for business and and people, you know making a profit if you're providing a value or a service of some sort. Um, but there, there's a, there's also a line where it's like, are you providing value or are you just creating the perception of value? Yeah. 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 And that's, that's where I think things get a little weird for me anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I guess like just to kind of close it out a little bit, you know, we've talked about obviously your, your social media presence and, and, and everything like that. Now you, and you mentioned it a little bit before, um, shifting over more so to like the content creation side, what are you doing over at Amazon? So, um, yeah. So at sports talk, I'm, I'm, uh, so sports talk is a baby network being that like the, the genesis of this network was like, October of last year like that's when that's when they were like workshopping this and like really getting it off the ground like at all you know so like companies like ESPN or like Showtime and stuff like like people you know HBO and shit like companies that are grandfathered in basically like we don't have that you know like we we're getting it on the ground floor and like in a lot of ways that's really cool because if it does end up being super huge then you have that accolade, right? Like you have that, you have that notch on your belt where it's like, Oh, I worked at sports talk when it was this, this, and this, you know? Right. Right. Um, 
So right now we're still trying to figure out our like vision as far as like what, what we want, what we want to get out of the social media landscape versus what we want to put into it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I'm sort of at the forefront of that conversation because, you know, the people that gave me my job were like, I love this guy. Let's get him for his personality and, uh, for his, for his knowledge of, of the content creation space. And, um, but now it's sort of shifted gears back to like sort of just cutting clips from the shows just to build that audience first before we dive back into like original content and stuff like that. And, um, it was pretty much the same on Jesus and Mero. It was just watching hours of footage and then cherry picking like the gems out of that, that would, that would perform well on, on social media. Gotcha. Yeah. Awesome. That's interesting. Um, and then I guess just to just to like wrap it up, uh, I ask pretty much everybody this at the end of the video or at the end of the podcast. Like, uh, what are your like long term goals ten years from now? Like, if you had the opportunity to do whatever you want and everything goes perfectly, like, where do you see yourself in ten years? Like, what do you want to be doing at that at that time? Yeah, I mean, in ten years, immediately I think of my kids. You know, mm-hmm. in ten years, Godric will be sixteen. Or well, no, Godric will be fifteen, right. and Griffin will be. 13 like i'll have 13 and 15 year old boys yeah you know what i mean like uh uh, you know (laughs) allegedly you know because 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 you know i i we don't know you know we don't know who they might become they could be fucking non-binary they could be trans whatever like but you know as far as i know i'll say it that way as far as i know i'll have 13 and 15 year old boys um in 10 years and what i want to ideally what i want to be doing is I want to lean more heavily into Hearst Boys as a fashion brand, as a fashion house. Um, mm-hmm. I want the Discord to be a well-oiled machine that people just kind of, people just kind of come to as a community, and it is that already. But I want to bolster it, invite more people. I want to get more, you know, more people there. Um, I want to do more music, uh, and in in ten years, hopefully, I'll be, you know, I'll be well into my acting and entertainment career and you know hopefully penning a script or producing or directing yeah we didn't even get to talk about all that yeah yeah. i (laughs) mean but but i'll I'll be back yeah yeah we'll have (laughs) to do this again yeah um in the meantime i guess if anybody wants to take a look at you know all the stuff that you're doing and see and see kind of that progression uh where can people follow you you can follow me on instagram tiktok and twitter uh all at rainy ovalle that's r-a-i N E Y O V A L L E. It's just, it's just my, it's just my government, man. Awesome. You can find me there everywhere. Uh, you'll see a bunch of my stuff, a bunch of my tattooing, all my content, like, you know, the stuff I've done with Jesus and Mero, stuff I've done with Sports Talk, my own things. Like, yeah. So, yeah. Also, uh, uh, as far as music, I am on Spotify and Apple Music. I'm everywhere as just Rainy, like okay. just R A I N E Y, Rainy, all caps. That's me. Awesome. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Jay. Bye, everybody.